So this morning we're kicking off a new series. You'll notice there <clears throat> on, the, uh, on the screens and in the background, we're, we're kicking off a new series entitled Blueprints. Blueprints and, and building godly character. And the, and, and the blueprint is basically the plan that tells you how to build something. Now that's my definition. That's not the technical definition. So I'm sure there's, there's architects and, and, and different construction people out here that, that could give you kind of a little bit better idea of what a blueprint is. But basically, you follow the blueprint, and that's how you know what you're going to build, how you're going to build it, what, what you're going to need, where it's all going to go. Um, so, but what we're trying to accomplish in this four-week series, and this four-week se- series will lead us up to when we're going to start our Easter series. And I'm excited about that, too. Uh, it, it's it's going to be a, a, a great experience as we, as we walk towards Easter. But what we're trying to accomplish in this series is we're going to help people to know how to build godly character in their lives. And this morning, we're going to take a look at our minds, our, our thought life. And, and here, just give you some interesting... Uh, any, by the way, do we have any brain surgeons in the room? If you would raise your hand. Any of you? One? Who? Nobody. Oh, okay. Well, good, because then uh, I can say whatever I want to, and no one will know the difference up here. So, no, I'm just kidding. I looked these up. So these are facts because they were online, and anything online is always true, especially when you go to Wikipedia. So, no, I'm just kidding. I went to different websites. Here we go. Just some interesting facts about your brain. The typical brain comprises about 2% of the body's total weight, but uses 20% of its total energy and oxygen intake. Interesting. Your brain weighs about three pounds. Okay, that's just the average size. 60% of the, of the dry weight is fat, making the brain the most fatty organ in the Bible. See, so it's, it's not here. And not in the Bible, in the body. So it's not here. <laughs> uh, sorry, I didn't have my Diet Coke yet. Um, by the way, that when, when you're, you may, this may be a surprise, but when you, when you hit a teenager, as a teenage years, your brain is not fully formed. It isn't until about the age of 25 or, or 26 that the human brain reaches full maturity. See, you, you know, the, the car rental places, they knew this. So that's why they don't rent a car to you until you're 25. And that's why insurance says that you can keep them on as your kids until they're 26 because they know they're not fully mature. The popular myth is that we only use 10% of our brains. Uh, and that is a myth, and it's flat out wrong. Brain scans clearly show that we use most of our brain most of the time, even when we're sleeping. By the way, there is no sense of pain. There are no pain receptors on your brain itself. You cannot... How many of you are ticklish? Raise your hand. Okay? Everybody look around. T- no, don't do anything. Yeah. Did you know that you can't really tickle yourself and make yourself laugh? You ever tried that? Doesn't work, does it? Yeah, and the reason why is, is because your cerebellum prevents you from doing so. That's what, it's responsible for, for physical movement, and it can, predict, it can predict the sensation, and it can prevent the response. And by the way, you know the whole idea about the light, when you get an idea, boom, the light bulb comes on. At 25 watts, that's what our brain puts out, our brain can generate enough power to, to illuminate a light bulb. Now, some of your light bulbs are a little bit dimmer than others. Or like mine, it never comes on, but that's the idea. So the brain, the brain is pretty amazing, and the brain is, is very, very powerful. Now, this is, this is psychology counseling 101, but what you think about something, uh, and what you believe about something, often determines how you, not only how you feel about this something, but how you act upon that something. The thoughts you have um, could be based on assumptions. They could be based on things that you've heard, things that you've seen, things that you've experienced. And we have thoughts about things that are accurate and that are helpful to us. And we can have thoughts or assumptions about things that are just irrational and, and really aren't true. But we think that they are. Like, for example, a helpful thought, I need to avoid putting my hand on that hot stove because it will burn my hand. Uh... A not-so-helpful thought, maybe a rational thought, I can never, ever get on an elevator because if I do, it will get stuck and I will run out of oxygen and I will die. Okay, that's a little bit of, a, of, of an irrational jump there. A helpful thought, I'm not a perfect person, but I do my best and I'm thankful for God for how he's blessed me and, and led me in my life. Uh, an irrational thought, an unhelpful thought, I'm a nobody. I can't do anything right. I'm worthless and my life is just miserable. So you see, you get the idea. There are these thoughts that we have that are helpful and that are true, and then there's other thoughts that we can begin to have 
that, that hurt us. And, and there's a battle going on for your mind. I don't know if you know this. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart. Now, it's not talking about this thing right here in your chest that's pumping blood to all over our body. But when, when the Bible talks about the heart, it's talking about basically your personality, who you are, your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions. It's just kind of like the, the, the epicenter of, of, of who you are. And it says guard your heart um, because the, the heart is, is... God knows that whatever controls your heart controls the rest of you. Whatever controls your heart controls the rest of you. And so he says that we have to, we have to control, control it. And, and I want to read in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, 1 through 5. This, this is going to be where we're launching for this morning in our conversation. Just a little bit of background. The Apostle Paul is writing this letter to the church in Corinth. And it's, it's around 56 AD. And in this section, Paul is addressing, he's talking to the church, um, the, the, the believers in the church, the new believers, and he's warning them about people who have come into the church and basically what they're trying to do is they're trying to create obstacles for God's design and for God's desire for their church, but also for their beliefs. They're trying to create these new systems, these different ways of thinking that, that, are, not, that are not about the gospel. And, and, and so he's trying to, they're, they're trying to trip them up with these new truths. So he's, he's addressing that, and we're going to pick up and uh, let's read those verses. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, starting verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself, appeal to you by the meekness of in gentleness of Christ, I who am humble among you in person, but bold towards you when I'm absent. For those of you who don't know, what he's kind of doing there is he's, he's been accused of being real gentle when he's with them, but then he's been accused of also being kind of a, you know, well, you're all bold and big since you're not here. And so he knows that, and so he's kind of saying, listen, I know what you're saying. I am humble among you in person, but bold towards you when absent. I beg you that when I am present, I will not need to be bold with the confidence by which I plan to challenge certain people who think we are behaving according to the flesh. Now, these guys that are coming back into the church who are trying to trip up this church, they're saying, you're not, you're not doing the things the way that you're supposed to do it. You're not doing church like you're supposed to. You're just you're kind of working off, off the, the ways of the flesh. For although we live in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh, since the weapons of warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. We demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. And so what, what Paul is saying there, he's saying, listen, we, we, I need to address what's going on out here with these people who are coming in and what they're trying to do, the, the things that they're trying to make you think, the things that they're trying to make you believe. And, and Paul talks about this in verse 4 and 5. He mentions spiritual weapons that are, that are, that are powerful to demolish strongholds, arguments, and things that, that are raised up against having the knowledge of God. And he goes on to say that we take every thought captive to obey Christ. And what Paul is saying is what they're accusing us of is actually what they are doing. He's, Paul is speaking against the wisdom of the world. And as one commentary put it, he says, it refers to any human act or attitude that forms an obstacle to the emancipating knowledge of God contained in the gospel of Christ and that keeps people in bondage to sin. Paul knows that what's coming, what they're teaching, what they're trying to get these new Christians to believe is only going to put them in bondage. There's not freedom through there. So Paul is saying that we need to wage war against these things. We need to fight against anything that would try to frustrate God's plan for the people of this world. And that includes our thoughts, the things that we believe. Our thoughts can keep us captive. Some of you know this. Some of you experience this. You, you, your thoughts just kind of keep you down. Our thoughts can sub, subvert God's authority and leadership in our lives. And our thoughts, they, they can become strongholds. This verse is in your worship guide, Philippians 4, 8. It's, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any, any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about those things. Think about these things. Again, Paul, writing this letter to the, to the church in Philippi, he's saying what you think about, what you believe matters, and so think upon those things. We need to keep our thoughts centered on the things of God because if we don't, then our minds become distracted, distracted and we can quickly start to, to think about, believe in, and start living like God is in charge. God isn't in charge. We start believing the opposite. We need, we need these blinders. Um, I don't know if you've ever, you ever watched horse racing. 
um, and, and you, you see the horse. And um, I watch the, try to watch the Kentucky, Kentucky Derby every year. I don't know why. I don't ride horses. I'm not a big horse fan. I don't own horses. I, I've never raced a horse. I've never been to a horse race, but that's just, this one just kind of intrigues me. Uh, I don't wear a funny hat either when it's Kentucky Derby or anything like that. But I just watch it. Just, I'm, I'm just kind of fascinated by the whole thing. But if you, and another thing that kills me is the, the names. And I know all the names mean something. Uh, like th this past year, 2018, there was Good Magic, Noble Indy, Enticed, Justify, Combatant, Lone Sailor. Uh, you know, and, and I get it that those mean something special, but whatever happened, just naming your horse Ed, you know, or, or Silver, Hi Ho Silver. I think if I had a racehorse, I'd name him Dwight. Dwight, I think, is the name that I would go with. But the, but, um, the, the whole idea, though, is, is the, these racehorses, if you notice, if you look at them, they have, you know, these blinders, and they're just a little patches of leather that, that and, and, and the reason why, the sole purpose of those blinders is to keep the horse focused when racing around that course. And I don't know if you know this, but the jockey on those racehorses, he has very little control over the horse. He's got some, he or she has some, but they have very little control. And if the horse decides to take a different route, then it will simply just take the jockey with it. And you can see that that would cause problems. So what the blinders do is keep the horse focused. And if we're not careful, we can let our thoughts take us off course. So we have to fight. We have to fight to stay focused. We have to fight to keep our thoughts centered on God. And if we don't, we can fall into a stronghold. Now, I want to I give you a definition. This is in your outline of what a stronghold is and for us this morning. A stronghold is a mental argument you believe that contradicts the person and power of Christ. A stronghold is a mental argument you believe that contradicts the person and power of Christ. A stronghold is it's a way of thinking that causes a way of living that leads us away from God. Did you catch that? It's a way of living, I mean a way of thinking that causes a way of living that leads us away from God. Think about a, a, a city that, that has a huge wall around it, okay? And no, this is not any kind of political endorsement, so leave that garbage out there. But just think about, think about the city, and, and, and it, it's fortified. It, it has become a stronghold because nothing is getting in. And when something becomes a stronghold in our minds, when it captures our thoughts, our ideas, or, or, these, or these other philosophies that are anti-God, uh, it, then our, our, they become a stronghold on our mind. And what it happens is it makes it very hard for truth to get in when we allow these, when we allow these other things to be, to be strongholds. And I wanted to quickly talk about four. Uh, these are common strongholds. Um, um, four ways of thinking that can lead us to pull away from God's will, from God's plan, His desire and calling for our lives. And just a little bit of a transparent, just a little transparency for you this morning. Um, these four that I'm going to list, I think at some point in my life, I've, I've dealt with, with all four. And uh, maybe you have too. The first one is this, is that God, you're not enough. You're not enough. And this, this becomes a huge stronghold when we allow our circumstances to dictate our belief in God's presence and in His provision. I've given my life to you, God. Why am I still sick? Why am I still depressed? Why am I still alone? Why am I jobless? Why is my marriage struggling? Why do my kids hate me? Why can't I get over this addiction? Why didn't you heal my loved one? If you were bigger, God, if you were stronger, if you were more caring, more loving, more merciful, then none of this would have happened. I wouldn't be going through what I'm going through. I can't depend upon you. I've got to take control. I can solve this issue. I'll look for answers elsewhere. God, you're not enough. You ever been there? You ever been there in the stronghold? Are you there right now? Because that's, that, if that becomes a thought that you have that you continue to, 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 well, to dwell on, it can become a stronghold in your life. Another one is, God, I know better. I know better. This becomes a huge stronghold when we know what we should do, but we just don't want to do it. We, we, we know it is right, or we know that the path that God is trying to lead us, but we don't like it. Because it's too hard, it's too inconvenient, it will cost me too much. I don't want to give up something, I don't want to sacrifice. I know a better way, God. Um, I, I know an easier way, God. I know that this, I, I just know better. And what this is, it's, it's like the ultimate clash with the Creator. The Creator knows the purpose and plan for His creation, and yet the creation feels like it knows 
better, that it's smarter and knows things about itself that the Creator doesn't. It's one of the highest forms of arrogance. You're, you're God, but God, you don't know everything. It's crazy, right? It's crazy. But I can tell you I've been there. I think we might all be able to say we've been there. But this, this arrogance in our life leads to a stronghold. The next one is, God, I, I am the exception. You're not enough. I know better. But here's another one. I am the exception. The rules, the boundaries, the guidelines, they don't, they don't apply to me. I'm different. I can handle this. You don't, really, you don't really know me. You don't really know my situation. You say this, but you don't live in, in my world, God. You're, you don't know my family. You don't know what I'm up against. I got this. I can make it work. I can figure this out on my own. But there's also the other side of this where we say we're the exception. And the other side is where we think the promises and the blessings of God don't apply to us. I know you're a forgiving and loving God, but you can't forgive this. You can't, you can't love me. That wisdom won't work in my situation. Your word doesn't have any bearing on what I'm going through. Times have changed, God. It's a different time. It's a different world. It's not like it used to be. God, you don't, you don't understand. Which leads us to our last stronghold, which kind of is just, I would say, is the foundation for the rest of these. And this is, God, I can't trust you. I know what you've said. I know what's in your word. I know what I've been taught. But I just can't trust you. Or another way to say it is this. I can't let go of control. If I let go, then I don't know where this will all go, where you'll take me, what you'll ask me to do, what you'll ask me to say, what you'll ask me to change. I can't do it. Now, some of you, in your, you're, you might be pushing back against this and you don't like to hear this, and you would say, I would never say that. I would never say those four things. And I can tell you, I've never said those four things either, but I've lived those four things. I've lived those. I've acted like that. And again, if we're not careful, these thoughts can become more than just thoughts. They can become beliefs, which then become actions, and then they become strongholds. There's this idea of law, the law of concentration in psychology that states that whatever you conscious, consciously and persistently direct your thoughts upon will grow and expand in your life. In other words, the more you think and reflect upon something, the larger the impact it will have on your daily choices, your behavior, and your actions. And that's why Paul was so adamant about speaking out against the people who'd come into the church at Corinth and started teaching things about uh, started teaching things that would put up a roadblock between them and God. Paul said that we have to take those thoughts what they're saying, we have to take those thoughts captive. It was a battle. And the reason he wanted to take those captive was because he he wanted to destroy those strongholds. And the reason why is because he wants us to obey Christ. I mean, it's right there at the end of verse 5. We take those strongholds work against obeying Christ. They're opposite of that. And Paul knows those power, the power of strongholds if those become beliefs and then become actions in our lives. And so what he wants to do is he wants us to take all those thoughts captive to point out where they're wrong, to point out the, 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 the misguided uh, way that they're leading, to point out the falsehood of those, to, to just actually call those lies because if we start, if we begin to listen to them, then we might start to believe, on, believe them. Then we might start acting upon them. And then here's the scariest thing. We might start telling others about it. So we have to take these captive. So how do we do that? How do we take every thought captive? Well, just three quick things here. Um, it, it requires a new way of thinking. A new way of thinking. You see, behavior modification is not enough. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed. Don't conform, be transformed. How? You ready for this? By the renewing of your mind. And the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. You notice that there was nothing in that verse that said, change the way you act. Now, that, that will be implied, but what, what Paul says there in Romans, he says, no, the directive there is not to change the way that you act, but the directive is to change the way that you think. 
renewing your minds. Behavior modification, that's, that's sort of a temporary fix. But if you don't change what you think and what you believe, then the minute you come up against a struggle or a trial or a temptation or a doubt or an obstacle or a question or where something doesn't make sense, then you're, you're not going to revert back to an action. What you're going to do is you're going to revert back to an old belief. And so Paul says well, we have to change the way that we think. And if you believe God is not enough, if you believe that He's not trustworthy, then that's exactly the way that you're going to act, that you're going to live your life. And by the way, the world will want you to and expect you to conform to culture. In case you don't know that, they, they want you to and they expect you to conform to culture. There's so many thoughts and beliefs and philosophies and ideas that are out there right now that stand in direct contradiction to God's Word and His calling on our lives. And we have to remember that our tendency is towards self and not towards God. That's our tendency. That's the sin. We are selfish creatures. Remember, our sin separated us from God. We don't naturally choose to follow God. But thank God that He came into our lives and He pursued us. So it's, it's a decision that we must make and a lifestyle we must choose to live. Our minds, they're, gonna, they're going to tend to run from God. So that's why Paul stresses we need to renew our minds, renew our beliefs, renew the way of thinking. The second thing there is requires fighting with spiritual weapons. Fighting with spiritual weapons. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13 says a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. How? Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against, listen to this, we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor. Why? So you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Now, I don't, I don't really believe that this is a, a passage that's talking about, you know, just demonic warfare. I mean, and, and I'm, not, I'm not denying that that's out there, but I think what this verse is really speaking to is the thoughts, the things that we believe, the things that, that we, we give our lives over to, that we have, we, we have to fight against those things. And here's the deal. We can't break these strongholds on our own. We can't break these strongholds. It's... it's it's impossible. We can't muscle our way out of this. We can't reason our way out of this. We can't buy our way out of this. We can't do enough self-help to get out of this. These strongholds fall only with the power of God working in us. That's how we defeat them. The battle for your mind, it's a spiritual battle. And guess what? The enemy has his own ideas. And he's going to do everything he can to bombard you with the thoughts and ideas that distract you from God's presence, that distract you from God's love, that distract you from God's direction, and that will distract you from God's will for you. Fear, worry, insecurity, uh, discontentment, these are all tools that the devil wants to use to keep you captive. He wants to reinforce in your mind that God is not enough, that you know better than God, that you are the exception, that you can't trust God. It all started, you remember, way back where? In the garden. It's exactly what he told Adam and Eve. You can't trust God. God's not enough. You know better. You're the exception. And he wants to drive those strongholds deeper and deeper into our minds. But here's the good news. You need some good news. God gives you exactly what you need to fight. He gives you exactly what you need to fight. God's Word is full of wisdom, instruction, commands, and promises that God has given each of us to implement into this fight. If you go on reading that passage in Ephesians, it lists out the, the armor of God. His Word is truth. God has given us access to Him through prayer. I think this is the, one of the most underutilized uh, weapons that we have. I know it is for me sometimes in my life. God has given us access to Him. But here's the deal. We pray, but, but sometimes we, we just pray little prayers. I said this before. Sometimes we pray, God, help me to have a good day. Well, what does that mean? You know what? If I don't have a flat tire, that's a good day. 
You know, or, or if I don't get pulled over for speeding, that, that's a good day. But what do you mean, help me to have a good day? And I think sometimes we, we, we pray these little prayers, but what we need to be praying is, is God, help me to overcome my selfishness in my marriage. God, help me to, to, to overcome this desire to want to be in charge. God, there are things that I think about. God, help me to overcome those through, through your word and through truth. God, bring someone in my life who can purposely disciple me and help keep me accountable in this area where I know that I am weak. You see, those, those, are, those are big prayers. Those aren't just general, God, you know, fortune cookie, help me to have a great day, God. Or God, be, be near me. And I think what we need to do is we need to get really specific with God. God, remind me that I'm not in control. God, show me places in your word that help me to know what it means to let you have control. God, bring people into my life. Be specific and be honest. And here's the other thing. Let others, let others in your Bible. That's another, that's another gift, that, another weapon that God has given us. Let, let them help you, in, help you, encourage you, pray for you, keep you accountable. And remember that as believers, here's the big one. You have, as a follower of Christ, you have the Holy Spirit in your life. You have... God in you. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's God's power flowing in you. You are not a slave to sin. You are not a slave to those thoughts. You can bust out of those strongholds by leaning on the Spirit to guide you and to empower you. We know our tendencies. We know our triggers. We know our temptation. God gives us wisdom to know what to do and how to avoid those. We can't claim ignorance, or we can't say, well, I just, I just had no choice. What happens is we, we tend to ignore it. We ignore the wisdom and leadership of God, and that only causes those strongholds to grow deeper into our minds. But with the weapons that God has given us, we can have victory. Now, it is a battle. Don't, do not underestimate that. It is a battle. God didn't say, you see that armor over there? Yeah, you don't need it. Just go do your thing. I got you. No, what God says, you see that armor right there? Put that on because you're going to go into battle and I'm going I'm to go with you and I'm going to fight with you. But we will have to fight. We have to put on the armor of God. We have to stand firm. We have to resist. But it, listen to this. It's a war that we will win. We just sang about it. We have victory in Jesus. And the only way that we lose is if we don't fight. And we're just idle creatures and allow every thought and every stronghold to take hold of us instead of standing firm. This also requires confession of sin. Psalm 139 uh, verses 23 through 24 says this. It says, examine me and probe my thoughts. Test me and know my concern. See if there is any idolatrous tendency in me and lead me in the reliable ancient path. We've got to point out the strongholds, the thoughts that are contrary to God that exist in our lives. And I love what, what David says there when he's writing this psalm. He says, probe my thoughts. In other words, just you know, dig in, dig, dig deep, see in there. What, what's in there. See if there's any idolatrous tendency in me. And you know what idolatry is? It's not about worshiping a statue or a cow or, you know, or, or that guitar over there. I, idolatry is, it, it, it's, it's about putting anything or anyone before God. That's idolatry. And a lot of time, the idol that we place before God is ourselves. We can't, we, we can't act like, well, no, 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 not me. No, we need to be honest with ourselves, and we need to be honest to God, with God, and say, God, here's, here's me, here's my mind, here's my heart. Probe it. You'll see, and, and, and you know what will happen when you start confessing? I think what happens is, is if you ask, start asking God that prayer, God, probe my thoughts, see if there's any idolatrous way in me, guess what's going to start happening is God's going to start pointing those things out. You're going to start to see them. You're going to start to notice them. And God will bring to mind the things that maybe you never even really thought before. 
we're doing this thing on Wednesday nights with, with several couples. Uh, it's called the Kindness Challenge. And the whole idea was for 30 days, uh, you, 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 decide, you signed up to take this, this challenge. And you, you weren't allowed to say anything uh, negative to your spouse or about your spouse. You were supposed to do one kind thing for your spouse every day. And then you were all supposed to tell your spouse something that you appreciated about them. And do, that for, do those three things for 30 days. And it's interesting to listen to the couples that were in there. Because when they started thinking about kindness, they started noticing more of how they're unkind. Things that they never really even thought about. Things that they never even really noticed. And that's what happens when we start telling God, God... Put, open my mind, open my heart, find the things in me that don't belong, find the strongholds, God, and help me. I, I want to confess those. Freedom is found in confession. Confession means that, you know what, I don't have to hide these things anymore. Confession says that I, God, I, I need you to help me, to give me the power to fight this battle. And the last thing there, it requires submitting to the authority of God. Luke 6.46, this is, uh, I don't think Jesus meant to be funny. He's probably upset, but to me it is. It's, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Why do you call me boss, but then you don't act like I'm boss? Why do you, why do you say that I'm in charge when, when you're clearly still in charge? Why do you call me Lord, but then don't act like I am Lord? James 1.22 says, do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Do what God says. You have to submit to His authority. That's a, that's a stronghold breaker right there. It's when we begin to obey God. And some of you might be saying, but Jimmy, you just said a couple of pages back, stronghold, a stronghold is not trusting God. So if I don't trust God, why in the world would I do what He says? So my answer to you is, what if, what if you're wrong? What if, what if God can be trusted? What if, what if God really is enough? What if, what if God does know better? What if you lived your life the way that God calls you to live? You know why some of us don't trust God? Because honestly, we've never really given it a try. You know why some of us think God is not enough? Is because we've never let ourselves solely depend on Him. Like, I have nothing else other than Him. You know why we think we know better? Because we've never given God's wisdom a chance. You know why we think we're the exception? Because we've never let God show Himself to be faithful in our lives. Or, maybe we, we, we did, or we felt like we did, but it didn't go our way. It didn't go the way that we thought. We didn't get the results that we thought we would see. It just, it didn't work out. But here's the thing. If we expect God to act like we want him to, then we will be disappointed because God is not like us. He doesn't think like we do. He doesn't act like what we do, the way we do. He doesn't love the way that we do. His ways are not our ways. And you see, the goal, is not for, for, the goal is not for Christ to be more like us. The goal is for us to be more like Christ. And I know there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of why out there. Like, why, God? Why? And that can become a stronghold in our life. But being a follower of Christ means trusting the who and not getting lost in the why. Why? 